all over in this book, uh, Created the Devil's Apprentice. Um, it's a book that came out of a conversation that I had originally with a gentleman that came to church here. Uh, I won't mention his name, just no reason to, but uh, I had gone out on Facebook. I was looking for a high school reunion, information about it. Ran into this gentleman who was writing some things about creation. I was like, oh wait, what's going on there? That's, that's not right. <laughs> what are you talking about? I know we've been in Sunday school together. You're, yeah. Where are we going with this? I had, did not know that this particular gentleman, while we were away in Indianapolis, had actually become an atheist. And what I also didn't know as I was on Facebook is what it meant to have someone tag you. It was my first time on Facebook, or one of my first times on Facebook. Had no idea that, that meant that those people are now getting drawn into the conversation. And what I found was that there was a group of about 100 atheists that kind of came out of the woodworks that were following this gentleman and basically said, hey, look, we're here to destroy your faith. They told me, if you look at this stuff, you will walk away from your faith. And I've been studying this stuff. This is back in 2012, I think, around that time. I've been studying this since 1993. I'm thinking, okay, great, whatever. I mean, if you all know me, I love to share the gospel. I love to talk to people about stuff. And so, hey, that's fine. Let's do this. Uh, four months into the discussion, I'm sitting there going, God, it doesn't matter what I say to these people. There's no way they're coming. Uh, they, they just are so bent against you, and their presuppositions are so strong in terms of what they're saying. And so I started praying and saying, God, where do you want me to go with this? And I felt like he was saying, God, or God was saying, Greg, I want you to meet them right where they are, and I want you to walk them backwards from there. And two months later, the entire group basically turned on their leader and said, hey, leave Greg alone. He's reasonable. He's logical. You can't argue the data because it's our data. And they started saying, hey, uh, Greg, we know this book, this Bible that you're talking about is not about creation. Tell us the rest of the story. And so I ended up being able to share the gospel with all of these people. That's back in 2012. Led to a ministry where I was talking to um, atheists, Muslims, all kinds of folks every night, basically, from about 12.30 to 2.30 in the morning, kind of with people all over the world. And it was, it was just fascinating, the things that they came to and the issues that they, they were, were dealing with. One of those issues was what Connor talked about today, the issue of pain and suffering. And uh, Connor obviously did a great job. Please listen to what he had to say. But what an atheist would say to Connor is, why in the world would he start it to begin with? If he is, and I'll put up the question that we're going to ask. That God is. Um, why would an omniscient God who is perfect in every way create anything that has a will of its own. It's um, <laughs> and, and think about where, how that question comes about when you're talking about the issue of pain. Because you're talking about, okay, he created mankind knowing that there would be suffering, knowing that the, eventually they would lead all the way to the cross. But, and so, and, and as Connor said, that all of this goes back to the issue of sin. That sin and the repercussions that it has in our world are, is what leads to pain and suffering. It's what leads to all the issues that we end up having. Um, and what that question led to was this one. You know, why would you make create a world where there would be sin? Why would you do that to begin with? And it led back to, it didn't start with man and man's sin. What it started with was the angels. Because he created them first. And if he created the angels first, and he's an omniscient God, and he's perfect in every way, then why would he give them a will? 
of their own. If he knows that by giving them a will of their own, they're actually going to end up rebelling against him. I mean, think about all the things that happens that he understands because of his omniscience. What, what, what does omniscience mean? I mean, just let me throw that out there. All knowing. All knowing. So, and, and we also know he's transcendent, right, with regards to Thomas, who knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. He knows everything that's going to transpire. And so he creates. He, he creates knowing that a third of the angels are going to rebel against him. And they're going to end up facing an eternity in hell. And I know some answers that can be there is to say, hey, wait a minute, but he does it. He gives everyone a choice. It's free will. Obviously, he gave them free will. They had a choice they made, which led to them actually rebelling. And some would say, hey, but free will is about love. You can't love unless you have free will. So um, he must have done it because he understood that, well, we're going to have this loving relationship. And someone is, some of these angels are going to be able to enjoy a perfect relationship with me. And it's going to be their choice as to whether or not they end up going there, right? Have you ever answered that question that way? What that leads you to think about is that, well, if he hadn't created any of them having free will, then the two-thirds of the angels that actually end up enjoying everything with him for all eternity, they don't miss out on anything. If he doesn't give them a will of their own and he doesn't go down that path, why? Because they've never been conscious to know that they actually would have this relationship. And I'm betting the other one-third of the angels are actually sitting there and going, I really wish you hadn't done this because I don't want to go through hell for all of you. That takes you to his nature. When I say he's perfect in every way, tell me what it means. What are the things that he's perfect about? What are his characteristics? Knowledge. Yeah, perfect knowledge. Justice. Justice, yeah. Love. His actions, yeah. Purpose or motivation? Yeah, his motivation, yeah. I'm going to throw in here compassion, kindness. The whole fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the whole fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Um, uh, he's perfectly holy. He's holy, holy, holy as the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. What does it mean to be holy? Yeah, it's perfectly it's perfectly righteous. It's per perfectly separated from that which is unrighteous. So he's all of these things perfectly. And he's saying, and, and, and I'll, ask, I'll also add in there, and this is a big one. Perfectly content, fulfilled within himself. He doesn't need anything. So, does he need to create because he's a creative God and therefore he wants to demonstrate his creativity? No, would be content. Yeah. Um, does he need to receive glory? He doesn't need any more glory. He need Our praise is for us to praise the perfect God. So he's omniscient. He needs nothing that the angels are actually going to give. Do you agree with that? Okay. He, he absolutely needs nothing that's actually coming for that. And, and he knows, though, that one-third of them are going to spend an eternity in hell. Two-thirds of them, if he doesn't actually do any of that, are not going to miss out on it. So it see, would seem that the perfectly loving thing to do would be to not create anything that has free. Because if I don't create anything that has free will, then no one's going to go through the suffering. We don't go through, you know, we created the angels. Now I'm going to follow that up with the creation of mankind. And I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to have to, in order to deal with this, I'm going to have to go all the way to the cross. My son, I'm going to have to turn my eyes from him. I mean, think about all the things, the dominoes that fall because he creates something that has a will of its own. But what do we know happened? 
he did it, right? And so the big question then becomes, why? why? Have you ever thought about that question? Why? In terms of all of this, because I mean, think about what Connor was talking about today. There is no message today that Connor would deliver had he not started with, I'm going to create something that has a will of its own. Because there would be no pathway that led down the, the path to sin. But yet he did it. Why? And so that was the question that came to me and that atheists in particular online were saying, Greg, you don't understand your whole faith is a contradiction. Because a perfectly loving God would not do this. And yet he did. And so then that causes you to have to, if you want to have a conversation with him, you have to start digging down and, and contemplating that. Let me first of all ask, has anyone come up with an answer themselves to this particular dilemma of our faith? Okay. It's okay. You know, I have, my faith is very simple. So. Right. Uh, and, and, and let me say, if you don't need need this for salvation none of this matters to salvation um, for us but for someone who's out there that's contemplating these types of questions we don't have a lot of really good answers at times um, I'm going to share with you where, where God led me I'm not saying it's the right answer so know that please up front I'm not going to say this is the answer but I want you to hear kind of where God took me in Scripture. If you started with the angels, I had to ask the question of, okay, God, what was the purpose of the angels? And if you look and see what angels do, they're guides, they're messengers, they're all these different things, right? But all of those relate to after man has been created. The one thing that they do that was involved when God was, it was just them and God, was worship. And we already established that God didn't need their worship, right? It doesn't need to be glorified anymore. It doesn't need to be anything to be more complete, more fulfilled in and of himself. But that, that's what their purpose was. And the only verse that I could find that had something to do with worship that might, to me, pertain to this particular situation, and I'm just going to throw it out there, was Psalm 22, 3. Can you... Why don't y'all pull that up real quick? Twenty two three? Yeah. Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. So you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Uh, have you ever heard it said that um, God inhabits the praises of Israel? Heard people talk about that. I mean, we we had it. We have. I had it last Sunday. I think that when Jack was talking, he talked about that the angels or, or that people inhabit the praise or God inhabits the praises of Israel. That our praise is something that He can inhabit. The angels were created initially to worship Him. Is it possible that God could actually inhabit the praises of the angels as well? And if he could inhabit the praises of the angels, what would he experience that he couldn't have experienced without being able to inhabit that praise? Remember, God understands what the cost is going to be by creating these things with free will. He doesn't need their worship, per se. inhabit the praises of these angels you're talking about an omnipresent God that without the praise of, the, of those angels them being created to actually be there to worship him would that place actually ever exist had he not created the angels unless they're created to praise him then that place that he can inhabit never exists and God, what's the greatest treasure that there is for us, for anyone, as it relates to God? Being able to know, knowing Him. 
knowing him, communing with him, experiencing him more. Is it possible that God actually could inhabit the praises of the angels and experience himself in a way that he had never experienced himself before? Think about it, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are inhabiting that. They would experientially know something that they would know omnisciently. They would know the fact of it, but would never have experienced it. Is it possible that that treasure is so great that when God looked at it and said, hey, if I don't create the angels to worship me, there's a chance that I could actually myself become discontent. Does that make sense? He's such a great treasure that if he doesn't inhabit the praises of these angels where he can experience himself in this way, he would miss out on the greatest treasure there was, which is to know himself more. I presented this to Rabbi Zacharias and their ministry, uh, just to let you know. So this is not me just thinking blindly on my own. I've talked to Tony Evans. I've talked to um, uh, Sean McDowell. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people about this. Yeah, I, I spoke to a rabbi. a rabbi school and talked to them about what all this stuff means. Um, the interesting thing, Rabbi Zacharias came back and said, this is the first answer that we've heard that actually presents an answer other than Augustine's, we'll have to wait till we get to heaven to actually know. So it was the first time they'd heard an answer that was actually a, 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 a complete answer that didn't contradict anything about the nature of God and what we see written about him. And, and it comes down to that God is what would happen to God if he understood that he could experience more of himself if he was to create these angels to worship him. His first reaction probably would be from an act of love. All this kind of stuff would have been to say, no, I'm not going to do it. But just how great a treasure is God? Would, is it possible that he could have this aspect of himself come into question? Is it possible that he could become discontent? And if he's a, an eternal being that he says that my eyes are too pure to behold iniquity, that now suddenly discontentment is actually within himself. He would have to live with himself as being the thing that he can't tolerate, which is imperfection. What do you know about perfection? We said it here. That he's perfect in every way. What does perfect mean? No mistakes. No mistakes. No, it's not tainted in any way. If you taint it in any way, it's no longer perfect. And we don't even understand what the word perfect really means because we've never seen it. We've never, I mean, I mean, Think of what, what we're talking about with God. The level of his perfection is so far beyond anything we can comprehend. And so now, that was what, what I came to, was that the only reason why a perfect God who's omniscient would actually create anything to have a will of his own, I hate to say it, is if he's compelled to do it. Now, every Christian's red flag should be going off, right? Because God can't be compelled by anything, right? If he's compelled by anything, that thing is God. But what's happening here in terms of who, who's compelling him? He's compelled by himself. His very nature, his perfection is what compels him. So, yeah, Chris. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I've, Interesting food for thought. My question is, so we know that God is a jealous God. He said so, yeah. right? But what you're saying here also hints that he's a selfish God, right? No. Because, and is, is that a problem? No, that, actually that is a question that was raised to me, was to say, okay, wait a minute, so are you saying <clears throat> therefore, because he knows that he could end up in hell, that he would end up creating a situation where these people are going to, these beings would end up going to hell themselves instead for him. I think that's where free will comes into this thing as well. One, you can't worship without free will, right? Two, free will makes it so it really is everyone's choice. 
as to what's transpiring. And the question is, does everyone have the choice? Does everyone, is everyone set up for a situation where they are going to, some of them are going to go to hell uh, without, without it being their decision? And I know uh, some Calvinists here may say, hey, wait, yeah, God created some, and he created them unto going to hell so that we, he, he could be glorified by that. To me, that is a situation where you end up in a place where, yes, I've, I've created something selfishly. I, why? Because he wants to gain glory, and he can gain glory from that. So if it's, if, I, if in me distributing my justice and doing all that uh, allows people to understand my justice, then I'm glorified and people understand me in a different way. But he's done it, creating them knowing he's created them actually to go to hell. And that's different than creating them with a choice. Um, and so I think what, the, what God has left, has done, and why it's perfectly just, why um, it's perfectly compassionate, it's perfectly all these things where he doesn't, uh, and it's not uh, unselfish, is that he has said, I'm gonna, how, how far would I go to maintain my own perfection? The answer is I would go all the way to the cross because unless I go all the way to the cross um, where I am willing to pay the price and do everything it takes to, to reconcile everything. Remember the Bible says in Colossians, I believe it is, that he was busy at, uh, reconciling all things to himself, both in heaven and on earth. I think that's the angels. He is helping to reconcile as well through what Christ does. Anything that gets re reconciled to him is done through what Christ did on the cross. And so, uh, which is a whole other can of worms in terms of what that means to the angels. Uh, but let me just say that he created the understanding that this was a way of escape for him, but he created the way of escape, the remedy that was there for everyone else. If they would just say, yes, would you be my remedy? Would you be my saving salvation? Would you do what you do on the cross and make it for me as well? It's a free gift, right? And he's actually offered it to all. So, um, yes, is he doing it because I think this is this plan is a plan that is more than the plan of salvation for mankind? Yes, I think it's a plan that actually rescues himself from the issue of what happens if I'm a perfect God. And I'm faced with a situation where I could become discontent. Jeff? Yeah, I mean, that, this gets a bit deep, but when you talk about the concept of perfect, yes. um, there is, in my view, it seems that there's not optionality to that. If you have one thing over here that is different than this thing, they both can't be perfect. That's right. Only one can be. And the reason why he did this is he knew it, it had to be this way. Absolutely. Because there, he, I mean, I don't understand it all, but I trust that he did what had to be done because he had to maintain that perfection. Yeah. And there was no way to do it aside from this because perfect has to be. There's no that. compromise. There's yeah. no deviation right. whatsoever if yeah. you're going to be perfect. So um, remember I said this was a, about will. Um, in order for you to be able to worship him, Remember how it says he creates us in his image? Um, when you create something in your image, what you're doing is creating something that's like you but not you. He created us in a form that we would be compatible with him but not him, meaning he gave you your own identity. Because if he doesn't give you your own identity, it'd be just him, right? Okay, so he created a being that had its own identity and with identity comes will. The reason why you are who you are is because you have your own sense of self, your own will. God's will is what? Do you remember what it says? There's three things that the Bible says that God's will is. Good, perfect, and pleasing. Okay, so perfect, right? His will is perfect. So if I choose to do anything that's outside of his will, let's say he wants to, he wants to do something that's perfect. And I say, I want to do something that's very, 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 very good. Is it perfect? Do you realize it didn't, that no matter who you are, 
if he gives you a will, it's an inevitable that eventually you will say, I want to do something just a little bit different than you. And it doesn't have to be bad. It just has to be imperfect for you to no longer be compatible with God. This is not an issue of good versus bad. This is a good, an issue that's involved that is perfection versus imperfection. And as soon as you take your first step where you say, I'm going to do something that's different than what you want, you've now made yourself incompatible with God. And so what God is at work doing through what he does on the cross is to make a way for you to be born again so that you are in a state where you start from a place of compatibility. You can't take someone who's fallen away and just say, hey, I'm going to. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you because you're coming from a place, even if you're forgiven, you're, you're still not perfect. you got to start over again and go from there. And that's why it's important to be born again. It's a new start. Yeah, I, I know you've thought through all this, and I haven't thought it deeply, but I, I, why isn't it as simple as with angels and the creation of people that God just knows how incredible it is? His love is so incredible, and he's thinking not about himself, but he wants others to experience it. So he creates them so they can experience that, and they won't fully experience it yeah. unless he allows them to have a choice where some will fall, and then they further experience the fullness. Just the scripture today, don't look at your current sufferings. Yeah. Look at what's ahead. It's you Once you see the sufferings, you realize how much more incredible this is. Right, so a third of the angels are gonna still end up in a place where they end up in hell. What percentage of people end up in a place where they are going to hell? I know he did it, yes, he did it because he, yes, you do get to experience his love, but I don't know, was it 60%, 80%? I don't know how, what percentage. Narrows the path that leads to righteousness. That's right, he says, and, and, and after the millennial kingdom, he says he opens it all up, and even those that have been with him and all that, it's like the sands of the, uh, the seashore those that actually end up following Satan after all of that. And I'm on mission, and I know that that's the way it's going to be. It seems, and again, I'm not saying this is the answer. Please hear that loud and clear. It's just something to give you food for thought as you dive in and think about how great our God is and what he's really done. If he's on mission and he knows that that vast majority of people Yes, they're going to give the chance to be able to experience that love, but they're not going to experience that love. It seems like the loving thing to do would be to not create any of them. Because if but then those they won't experience it. But they wouldn't know it if they weren't created. But then you go back to how incredible is heaven. And he right. wants others to experience that. But that but does he need that? It's not about him. It's about he wants others. I mean, that's what I, where I'm thinking. No, I understand that. And, and pr trust me, I, 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 I agree. That is absolutely a reason why God could do it. Hey, I'm, I'm giving a bunch of people an opportunity to be able to experience me that never would have. And that is, is the greatest treasure, right? Is to experience him, to know him, to commune with him, to have a relationship with him. But he's, he's willing, in order for that, those people to experience that, Many more are going to experience the antithesis of that. And then it goes back to when the people that Greg talks to, if you have an omniscient God and He knows that, and He still makes that decision, then how do you call Him? How do you call Him? I'm a loving God. I'm, I'm with you. I live in the world where you live. Yeah. But this is the world that Greg is because right. because of the people He talks to, they will go back to saying all of that that they'll say that He's omniscient and He knew it was going to happen. And he knew that people were going to get condemned without making a choice and be condemned to hell, then why would a loving God ever create anything in the first place? Because and, and you say just because he, he wants them to experience it. Well, it's I mean to, to for for them to be able to experience all of his love, for a vast majority of others to experience his wrath. And he gets nothing really else out of it. Or there's nothing that's, that's that makes that situation be something that has to happen. You, you start.
start to say, wait a minute, that sounds like it's much more of a wrathful decision than it's a righteous decision. But I don't understand the, the, the thought process that God is going to inhabit the presence, the praises of his people. Yes. All that other stuff still happened too. So, I mean, the argument, either way, the argument, why would God do that? Because all these other people are suffering. I, I, that's what I'm having trouble connecting with. Because you're saying you have trouble. I mean, either way, if you argue, if God No, because if he doesn't create any of them with a will of their own, then no one experiences either side of it. And he's completely content with it being that none of them are created at all. Because he's perfectly content within himself and fulfilled within himself. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to go back to the original. It's a lot. Uh, about him inhabiting the praises of his people. So yeah. he did that because he was concerned about him. I, I don't, I'm not getting the, him concerned about what might happen to him uh, because that whole line of thinking ends up with a lot of people still being uh, just subject to destruction. But is it, it, at that point, you've ended up in a place where it's per, still perfectly just because now it's a, it's a decision that they, had, they got to make as opposed to not. Um, if he had just created them unto uh, the, where there was no decision, there was no free will choice about it, then you end up in a place where Sorry, no, I'm not yeah, it's completely that at all. Yes, yeah. no, I, I wouldn't fully experience God that way. And, and, and I think, um, and we got to wrap up, um, understand that with um, the expression of will, um, it's not like God could say, hey, I'm only going to make, because some people will ask this question, why doesn't he just make those that are going to freely choose him then? Because if you take, if you, if he only created those that actually made the choice of him, he actually eliminates free will. He eliminates choice. He eliminates worship um, because he's actually created the situation in such a way that you had no choice about it. You actually were, you were going to worship him. There was no choice about it. So anyway, again, not trying to say any of, of this is something where this is the answer, but here's what my challenge is to everyone. Um, it, there is a lot of things that we think about in the Christian faith where we, we answer one element of some, an answer to a question that, that, that can reconcile and be congruent with some aspect of his character. And many times what we fail to do is recognize what that means on another aspect of his nature. If God is not perfect in all ways, at all times, then you've ended up in a place where you've lessened who God is. And so uh, as you contemplate your faith and look to go deeper, challenge yourself. And if it doesn't lead you deeper into scripture, then you're looking in the wrong place. Dig there, and and that's where the answers are. So this is kind of where I've I've been led, and would love to hear people's challenges. Write me, send me an email if you got questions. Um, be more than happy to try to answer those. And quite frankly, I want that because all of us are seeking for truth and seeking God, and God is truth. Um, uh, so we want to find him. And so if something I'm thinking is maybe a little off or whatever, when you challenge me, it causes me to dive deeper into scripture where I can get closer to him and get closer to that truth. And I think that's, that's actually ironing, sharpening iron. That's I'll just that. say real quick, though, to me, the good news about this is understanding this is not dependent upon our salvation absolutely not you know and so to me that's the thing you have to remember so you're not caught up in we've been through this with one of our boys and it came down to you are not going to understand this probably yes. ever ever no but one that is not critical for your salvation that's so right. that's just the bottom line thank you for sharing that because yeah. that is the, the most important part of this as we dig, dig deeper, we try to understand God more, and I think God is at work transforming us by the renewing of our minds. He is looking to help us to understand Him better. Yeah. But this has no impact on the gospel. The gospel is, you know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Who 
whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And uh, this just gives maybe some question, uh, some answers to some questions of why things are the way they are. If you've been struggling with some of those kinds of questions, or someone that you know has been recently placed. All right. Write me if you have any questions. All right, let's close it out. Dear God, thank you so much, Lord. We love you. Uh, we don't pretend to know every answer. Your thoughts are uh, higher than our thoughts. Your ways are higher than our ways. As far as the heaven is above the earth, so are your thoughts than our thoughts and your ways than our ways. Uh, but God, uh, to the extent that you can uh, enlighten us and, and, and show us a little bit more, God, we want to know you more. That's the bottom line, God. So we want to get more intimately close to you. And uh, we know that we can do that only by the leading of your spirit and the enlightening that comes from your word. So God, uh, to the extent that anything I shared here was enlightening, um, because that's what you, 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 you were thinking, then God, I pray that that would speak to someone. Lord, I know I'm not right on everything. I'm, not, I'm just a human, just thinking about this stuff myself. But God, uh, to the extent where I'm off, I pray, God, that you just guide me, guide us all deeper into your word and that we would be used of each other. Hopefully this is maybe a thing that spurs us on as a class, that we would sharpen iron, sharpening iron, that we talk about some of this stuff a little bit more deeply, and um, we, you would use each of us in each other's lives to, to get just a, an inch closer, Lord. Um, we just want you. We want you, God. Uh, thank you for these, these uh, brothers and sisters in mind. Pray in Jesus' name.